The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access for Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at 260-421-1250. Hello, this is Patty Hunter of Patty's Page. Welcome to my show. Today I have a special guest. His name is Dr. Andrew Malali. That's how you spell it? That's correct. Thank you oh, for I having me, right. Patty. So, um, we just finished a seminar here at the Allen County Right to Life. And we were talking about the end of life. Mm -hmm. So, where are you originally from? I'm originally from Michigan, but I moved to Fort Wayne for my training, and I, I really liked it here. So, training for? Family medicine. Family medicine. So, where did you go? University or? Yep, Michigan State University for mm -hmm. medical school, and before that I went to a school down in Florida, Ave Maria University. So, you've been around? A little bit, which says a lot about Fort Wayne, because after everywhere we've been, this is where we really wanted to call home. Yes, Fort Wayne is very nice. Um, you deal with young people, old people? All ages. And between. And babies? Yep, we see a lot of babies. Do you deliver babies? I don't deliver babies anymore. Mm -hmm. one, of, one of the things I've realized in this community is we're blessed to have a lot of good OB providers, mm -hmm. but not enough people to take care of the other ages. And so while I don't deliver babies anymore, I still enjoy seeing a lot of babies in the office. It is so nice to see the population still exploding in, the, in its own way. Since the abortion and everything like that, it's good to see that people are still wanting babies. That's true. And are they turning their way of thinking towards abortion nowadays? Are they still abortion-minded or...? You know, it's hard to say. I'm, I'm blessed to see a lot of people who choose to come to me. And one of the things that's very important to me is my pro-life beliefs. Yes. So a lot of the people who come to me are coming for those beliefs. So I think, unfortunately, a lot of the women in crisis who are considering abortion, uh, I see some of those folks, but not as much. And so yeah. we, we, uh, I'm, I'm always happy to see any patients that come. So all are welcome. That's right. When um, that in the seminar you were talking about uh, end of life, uh, the the reasons why some people don't want to live anymore, mm -hmm. uh, what people have been doing in other countries, like uh, Netherlands and Switzerland, mm -hmm. they're doing uh, assisted suicide, did you say? Correct. And euthanasia? Correct. Why? Well, you know, it's one of those things that Europe has legalized before America did. Yeah. Um, but now we know that physician-assisted suicide is legalized in several places throughout our country. Um, assisted suicide is where a prescription is written by a physician, uh, given to a patient, and the patient uses that medicine to end their life. Euthanasia is where the physician or medical team will administer a medicine usually in the in the IV to kill the patient very much like lethal injection of criminals um, both of these are bad practices for a mm -hmm. lot of reasons but unfortunately it is something that we're seeing more and more of first in Europe and now even in America so what is the main reason behind all of these assisted suicide and euthanasia why are they killing themselves off well there are several reasons we know that about almost 80% of people are clinically depressed at mm. the end of their life. So for many people, it's depression. No, natural? As far Is it as natural to have depression just before they die? Or? It's common, I'd say. It's common. But it's still a disease, yes. you know, and so it's something that I think should be treated as a disease rather than, you know, acquiescing and saying, okay, if you want to end your life, that's the best way to go. I don't think that's true at all. Well, why, just, why are they encouraging it? 
Well, I think the reason they're encouraging it is because, you know, it depends who's encouraging it. Some people, I think, are encouraging it to save money. Money, yeah. You know, other people would be encouraging it because they, they believe that it's the best thing for the patient, but I'd say that's wrong. It's a false compassion to think that ending a patient's life is going to be helpful. You know, even if they're suffering, you've got to treat the suffering, and you cannot cure suffering by eliminating the person who suffers. This world, uh, I feel that it's not compassionate enough anymore. There seems to be a lot of killing uh, young people, old people, in between. Mm -hmm. uh, have they forgotten about Jesus? I think that's, that's definitely a big part of it. I mean, if you, don't, if you don't treat other people with love and respect, then you're going to end up with the culture of death that we have. And, you know, Jesus is the antidote for that. He set the example of love, you know, um, and showed what true love is. So um, tell me the uh, origins of assisted suicide when it started. Or that's two generations? That's two uh, centuries? or Sure. I, I would say it's been around forever to some mm. extent because even in the Hippocratic Oath 2,500 years ago, right. Hippocrates went out of his way to say, I will never dispense medicine to help someone end their life. So even back before the time of Christ, 2,500 years ago, people were clearly talking about it because he had to go out of his way not only to say he won't do an abortion, but he'll also never help with assisted suicide. Yeah. So it's been probably as old as humanity, but it's definitely gotten worse in the last couple decades. Oh, that's weird. I mean, this world is getting worse. Without our Jesus, we would be completely lost. But is this what you've been finding the last several, how many years has it been now since this death culture really been surging? It's, it's hard to say, but it's the, you know, there's, while there's a lot of reasons to be disappointed, I think there's also hope for the future, um, hopefully in reaching out and changing the hearts and minds of, of people. And, uh, and your role in all this is to go around educating people about the end of life and assisted suicide and all that? Well, you know, I, I believe when, when you've been given a lot, you're expected more, you know, and that's what we read in the Bible. And so I feel like this, this is the garden God put me in. I'm going to try and tend my garden and yeah. help people as best I can. You know, one of the things is in relation to the cost of health care, health care gets more expensive every year. Mm -hmm. It's a blessing to discover new things and new treatments, but they're expensive. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people think more expensive than they should be. Yeah. But every year, the amount of money we spend on health care goes up, up, up. I think it's maybe 17% of our GDP every year, um, and it's a higher percentage of our pie that the, the country makes every year. Out of that, Medicare is the biggest one. And we, we know from studies that in the last six months of life, over a quarter of Medicare cost mm -hmm. occur then. Mm -hmm. So for the people who are trying to save money, assisted suicide is a very appealing thing to them because, gee whiz, if you cut out that last six months of life, you save 25%. When we're talking about that. That's maybe 5% of the entire economy every year. Um, and so basically, I think for, for folks that do not respect the individual dignity of every person. They're looking at this more as a, a cost problem. Mm -hmm. I understand why they think it's an okay thing to do. Mm -hmm. Now they're wrong right. because they're not thinking about people being created in the image and likeness of God. However, if their goal is to save money, it's, there's a lot of money being spent, so that's where they're coming from. And this thing in the Netherlands as well as Switzerland, uh, I've heard of a friend of mine saying that they're worried about their elderly mother, mm -hmm. that she was going to be killed by the, the government. Mm -hmm. Since when did the government take over trying to decide who lives and who dies? Well, when the government controls health care, right. they get to decide who gets what and when they get it. And we see that 
commonly, well, just recently there was the, the infant Alfie Evans. Uh, and, and before that, there, there was another infant with a similar story a few months ago. Yeah. And really when the government's put in charge of health care, it's not up to you, it's not up to your doctor, it's up to whoever's paying for things. And so I'm somebody who's passionate about private medicine, where the patient and the doctor have a relationship. You know, to some extent insurance companies are involved, but it really should be up to the patient what they do. And, and they can search out the doctor of their choice receive the treatments that they'd like, avoid treatments that they don't want. And these you know. people want to take their Alfie out of England to go to Italy mm -hmm. to cure their child, and the government in England decided against it. Well, and that's, that's one of the big problems is that it's not even so much about what the parents want anymore, it's up to the government. Uh, the government to has no so, right no right to do that. I think it's a big, it's a risk. It's a risk. Mm -hmm. So uh, your goal in life really is? My goal in life? Mm -hmm. My goal in life is to help other people and go to heaven someday. You know, that's, that's my goal and right now the, the most imminent way of doing that is hopefully caring for my family and my patients and uh, I got to talking about assisted suicide because nobody else was talking about it. Yes. And so hopefully if I can help change the minds and hearts of people and inform people who already have the right opinions so they can be more effective in helping others, that, that's what I'd like to do. And you're going around doing seminars. How many seminars do you do a year? I don't know. To tell you the truth, I don't know. Every couple of months I'll, I'll give a talk. It's not something that I, I try and do with great regularity because I'm, you know, Primarily at my job, I think my my day job is to care for my patients and see folks in the hospital and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I I like to speak on this stuff when I could be of use to people. So I'll, I'll do maybe a half a dozen talks or a That's dozen good. a year. Do you have people? A lot of people come up to you and asking you about that. More than you you'd think. You know, I mean, in in day to day life, most of my work is just regular family medicine. But there's you know, death is something that touches all of us, and especially end-of-life decisions. If it's if it's not regarding ourselves, it's about a loved one, a friend, family member. And so I really enjoyed talking about folks with that uh, that topic because there's so much bad information out there. And if if you're not careful who you're talking to, you're probably going to get bad advice. That's true. Well, I'm glad that you're going around talking to people. Going to different places. Where where do you normally go? Churches or mm -hmm. schools? I, uh, usually, usually small groups, small mm -hmm. small communities of folks, uh, either like the Right to Life, mm -hmm. um, Lutherans for Life. A lot of times, we'll we'll talk. Last couple of weeks ago, I gave a lecture down at the medical school, Marion University, oh. down in Indianapolis, talking to medical students. So hopefully just trying to uh, affect change so that they'll think about this before they run into it and it won't surprise them. You know, I think you're right. And what you're doing is the most splendid thing I've ever, ever had. Oh, that's Listen very sweet of you to say. I don't know. I mean, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for having me on the show, Patty. <laughs> So, just a brief bit about uh, myself, born in Michigan. My folks actually are two family doctors in Michigan. So I got peaked uh, early in my interest for medicine. Uh, got my practice here at Cradle Family Medicine. One of the things that I was passionate about is trying to practice ethical medicine in, in a world where the, the big hospitals, although they do so much good, there's, there's a lot of bad that can be done too, especially when nobody's really thinking about the ethical aspects. I think many people would be dismayed to know that we have assisted suicide, like things happening in Fort Wayne uh, with some regularity, terminal sedation where, you know, it, it's, a, it's a fine line. I'll, I'll define that term. Terminal sedation is a bad thing, just to be clear. But instead of killing the person, we just want to bring them into a coma until they die, you know, for days, weeks, months. It's really just killing them slower. Um, but that happens in Fort Wayne, unfortunately, and that's ethically totally wrong. But legally, it's not really been addressed. So that's one of the reasons I want to do my own practice so I can make sure we're allowed to do the right thing. Next slide. Okay, so how did I get involved in this? Uh, just a little bit about uh, how that happened. April 2016, there was this guy down from Indianapolis 
uh, oncologist who said, you know, we want to bring assisted suicide to Indiana, and he put it out in our doctor newsletter and said that we're going to start a resolution at the Medical Society to make the doctors go neutral. We've always been opposed to assisted suicide. The American Medical Association's always been opposed. It's a bad thing for a doctor to be willing to kill you. Um, however, we know now that there's seven jurisdictions in the country that we'll touch on later that it's allowed. And so this guy in 2016 said, we want it in Indiana, just a heads up, we're going to bring this up at the convention. So his mistake was giving us six months to plan. Um, because we were able to get a couple op-eds going in the newspapers. We actually got about 30 physicians that have never been to this conference before to come down and testify against it. Next slide, please. And we really cleared the benches, which was nice. There's a lot of local doctors here. Dr. Fernandez, you probably see there. I think, I'm trying to remember if that's Dr. Tyndall as well. But uh, there's a lot of people who never came to this meeting before. But there's three people, three doctors that got up and said, we want assisted suicide. There's 30-some who got up and said, it's a terrible idea. We all had our own reasons. They were, they were shutting us off because they're like, okay, we get the point. So uh, in addition to shutting down their resolution, we were able to pass a resolution in Indiana. Indiana never had a statement on assisted suicide, but now we have an official statement against assisted suicide as of 2016, which is a huge thing. Because in all the states where assisted suicide is legal, the first step is getting the doctors to go neutral. They used to be opposed, but now they say, we'll just go neutral. We don't have an opinion whether it's good or bad to kill people. And so if the doctors go neutral, it's a green light for legislators to push through legislation. So we knew this was going to be one of the early battles, and we were happy to win. And I think that's one of the big reasons we don't have it in Indiana yet. So I'm, I'm really happy to have been involved in that a little bit. Next slide. Um, we talked about the definitions, assisted suicide versus euthanasia. Euthanasia means the good death. Um, and another kind of semantic difference we should talk about, physician-assisted suicide versus physician aid in dying versus death with dignity. Now these terms all mean the same thing. I, I, not I, a doctor writes a prescription for you to administer to yourself to kill yourself. However, physician-assisted suicide, that sounds, uh, uncomfortable suicide. Um, but aid in dying sounds nice, and death with dignity, who can't get behind that? Now, what they mean with death with dignity is not what I would call death with dignity. So when you read those terms, that's just code for assisted suicide, but they don't want it to sound so bad. Next slide, please. Where have we been from the beginning of time, effectively, you know, Natural law is written on our hearts. Everybody knows what's good and bad inside themselves, even if they haven't been taught it clearly. But from the beginning of time, Aristotle, St. Thomas, everybody talks about how we, we should not kill ourselves and we should not help people kill themselves. Next slide. Even in the New World, uh, one of the earliest penal codes that we have from New York and even Rhode Island, 1647, specifically talked about how it was unnatural to aid in someone committing suicide, and it was a punishable crime. Next slide. Um, in 1804, things started changing a little bit because they discovered morphine. Morphine we use to relieve pain and sedate people, but also, unfortunately, it can be used to kill people, just like in the opioid overdoses that you probably read about in the newspaper. You take too much, you know, it's a fine line between pain relief falling asleep, stop breathing, and death. So it's not a, a violent way to die by any means, but it's a way that you, people have been euthanized before. And so even as early as the 1870s in America, they've started changing their opinion. Uh, Samuel Williams was a school teacher, but he said, you know, if somebody's in pain, we should allow them to kill themselves. But very quickly, even into the 1890s, they said, actually, not just pain, but if somebody's a burden, that might be a good reason to kill themselves because they don't want to be a burden. And as early, you guys might be surprised by this, I was surprised to learn this, as early as 1906, there was a push in Ohio and Iowa to legalize assisted suicide. I kind of thought this was a, a newer thing until I delved a little bit deeper. But just like so many social issues, you look at the, the national polling, whatever poll you look at, 50, 50, 60, 40, people are very divided on, on issues of right and wrongness. Um, but even in 1906, Iowa, they said not only should assisted suicide be legal, but if a doctor refuses to help the patient who wants that, the doctor should be fined and imprisoned. Um, so this is 1906, this is 100 and some years ago. 
So it, as much as this is a critical time for, for this movement, it's been going on for a long time. So we have the advantage of looking back at history to see, see how we should proceed. Uh, next slide, please. 1915, there was a doctor in Chicago, Dr. Hassel, and he was a surgeon. There was a new baby born with a lot of problems, and he chose not to operate, not because it might hurt the baby, the baby might die in the operation, but they said, actually, this baby's life is not worth saving because it has too many problems. And so in, in medicine, that hadn't really been done in recorded history before, and the jury acquitted him because he went to trial for this, but the doctors all kicked him out. They said, you're not one of us. They kicked him out of medical societies. That is 1915. 1936, King George V of England, um, there's some information that's come out that he might have been partially euthanized or his death has been hastened by medications. And one of the earliest polls I could find, 1937, 45% of Americans said that killing mentally disabled kids and deformed babies was okay. 45%, that's half of people. 1937, that's America. Next slide. If half of Americans think it's okay to kill mentally disabled people in 1937, is it really that big of a leap to look at the Nazis? You know, 1939, Hitler was doing it. Half of Americans thought it was okay to do, but Hitler had, uh, you know, this was one part and one of the beginning parts of the atrocities the Nazis committed. They had about 8,000 kids forcibly taken from their parents. I, I found these pictures. You've got a Down syndrome kid, scoliosis, club foot. These kids, we have treatments for all of this stuff, but they didn't have time for that and it wasn't worth it to them. Um, over 300,000 handicapped kids were euthanized against their will, and this was really the start of the, the Holocaust where people weren't targeted necessarily for their ethnicity or their beliefs, but because of their disabilities. But now if, if you look at the Americans, half Americans would say that's okay, 1937. So we really, I, I think the Nazis are villainized so much, but it's really an indictment of everybody, I think, because even back then the half Americans would have said that's okay. Um, Adolf Yost was one of the ethicists that helped Hitler figure out what was ethical, scary. Uh, he said the state must own death. It's up to the state. You've got to keep the social organism alive and healthy. You're going to hear some, some talk a lot like that later in the presentation. Uh, and this was Hitler's ethicist. Um, where we've been, that's perfect. Uh, Hitler's goal was to try and create a master race, and he had ultimately between 6 and 11 million people killed. Uh, next slide. Eugenics, just like euthanasia, eugenics, it's Greek, uh, was well born, it meant well born. And Francis Galton, cousin of Darwin, uh, the guy who came up with theory of evolution, um, he was the one who came up with this idea of eugenics, that you gotta weed out uh, the weak links, get them out of the gene pool. Um, William Goodell was a gynecologist who really advocated for castration of the insane because he didn't want them reproducing. You, you hear about this kind of talk coming out of Planned Parenthood very early on as well. Next slide. Um, brain death criteria. The idea of brain death, uh, I think, is intimately related to this because back, back in the day, whenever that was, you can envision a time, heart stops, people stop breathing, there's no more blood flow. It's very clear that the patient has died. Nowadays, not that clear. We can make their heart keep beating. We can make them keep breathing. Uh, we can make their blood keep pumping with an ECMO machine. At what point do they die? Because we can keep their vital signs looking normal artificially for a long time. Many of those people recover. A lot of them don't. And so it's, it's hard to figure that out. So one of the things they tried to do in 1968 was to develop this idea of brain death. The brain is dead, so even if the vital signs look good, we know that they're not coming back, or we are asserting that they're not going to come back. And one of the main reasons they, they wanted to do this, one, was the ability to transplant organs, because if somebody has died and they have no heart beat, they have no respirations, um, there's no blood perfusing the tissue, those organs are no good. So you really need to find, you know, to, to have an ethical organ transplant, you need someone to have died, so you're not taking it from a living person, but you need their heart and lungs to still be working. I, I think this is a lot more ethically troublesome than many people realize. I, it'd be very hard for me to point out and say, that person's definitely dead, but their heart and lungs are still working. Very difficult. One of the reasons they came up with this is because uh, 
not only organ transplant, but those in needs of hospital beds, the beds are already occupied by comatose patients. So we gotta clear out the bed because it's not, we're spending those resources on this person. And so that, that's kind of the history of the brain death criteria. Not that it's necessarily a completely bad idea, but it's ethically troublesome, and the reason it was invented is not because it's a, a natural progression of the science, it was a, a practical progression of we need the beds, we need to figure out whose organs we can take. Next slide. <coughs> Quinlan case, 1976, talked about people in pers persistent vegetative state, and they were identifying that, okay, it is legal to remove life support if we know that it's futile, which we would say is ethically okay. Back then, life support was still kind of a new thing, so they are trying to figure this out. 1980, Hemlock Society, which is now Compassion and Choices, was founded. 1980, uh, St. John Paul II had a really good uh, piece, if, if you guys have never read it, it's actually by the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith, but it was a declaration on euthanasia. Same year that Compassion and Choices was started, they said, okay, we really gotta get something on paper, so for people looking at more of a philosophical perspective, that's a great place to turn to. 1984, America support, or, uh, AMA supports withholding life-sustaining treatment when it's futile. And then in 1990, we, we quickly go from stopping treatment if it's futile to helping them along to die with Dr. Death, Jack Horkian, from Michigan, where I grew up. Mm -hmm. So I heard all about him growing up. Time Magazine, actually. He was on 60 Minutes, he euthanized somebody on television. Next, next slide. 97, Washington versus Glucksburg uh, defined that there's actually no constitutional right to die. This was upheld last year by the New York Supreme Court. New York, not a particularly conservative state or one that particularly uh, respects life very well, but even the, the Supreme Court unanimously agreed that, yeah, there's no constitutional right to kill yourself. Anybody who says that, that's gibberish. And so I, I was happy to see that out of New York. They actually also, they address the question about assisted suicide versus aid in dying versus death with dignity. And they said from a liberal lawyer perspective, it's the same thing, we gotta call it assisted suicide. You can't call it this other stuff legally. And so that, that was, in my mind, a victory just for the, the phraseology, making sure we all talk about the same thing. 1997, Oregon Keeps Its Death with Dignity Act. It was passed, I think, in 94 originally, but in 97 it went into effect because there were some challenges. And then in 2001, the Netherlands uh, legalized euthanasia, and they were the first people in, in Europe to start that. Next slide. 2005, Terry Schiavo, uh, as, as many of you have heard of, this is Bobby Schindler. He just spoke recently up in Gary, I believe. And he said, you know, Terry's situation was and continues to be described as end of life, but it wasn't really end of life. He said that his sister Terry, she wasn't really dying. She didn't have a terminal illness. Her brain was injured, and so she couldn't care for herself, but she wasn't actually dying, so it wasn't really end of life. She had been like that for, what, 10, 13 years, something like that. So they say end of life, but in reality, it's just disability. Godspeed, my love, until we meet again. You're always in my heart and every dream. Don't let this time apart give in to all our fears. God will keep us close from up above. So until we meet again, God speak my love. God is with us always for the rest of our lives.